Hello, my name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including how it most impacts those who are impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and we highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that are affected. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments with us on Twitter at Fortune SOC. Today's show is entitled Housing Discrimination and what best ways to address it. Today, I have some really fantastic guests and we look forward to you joining us for today's show. You know, the Fortune Society has developed its own nationally recognized housing because we saw the desperate need for our homeless clients and the lack of available options available to them. As we developed our own housing, we saw how deeply embedded discrimination and other collateral consequences of criminal conviction really keeps uh, injust keeps justice impacted individuals from accessing even the limited supply of affordable and supportive housing. People with conviction histories really face toxic combination of factors when seeking and securing housing. Their income challenges make it hard or impossible for most to afford market rate housing in a high cost markets like New York City, and the supply of affordable housing is sharply limited. Discrimination based on record as well as on race further limits the ability of people and their families from actually accessing an already limited supply of affordable housing. These discriminatory practices contribute to the growth of the prison to shelter pipeline, the growing and all too common phenomenon of formerly incarcerated people living in homeless shelters or on the street because they cannot secure housing. Very rarely can they find housing that they can afford and still have room for living expenses. It is imperative that we address the problem of restricting people from the limited affordable housing that is available based exclusively on criminal justice involvement. Our discussion today will focus on understanding the impact of the problem of this kind of housing discrimination, the work that the Fortune Society is doing and other organizations have undertaken to address it and the optimal solutions moving forward. Today's guest we have today, obviously we're really grateful for is Tara Benedict. Tara Benedict serves as a housing advocate for the Fortune Society. We also have joined with us Ian S. Wilder, Esquire, who serves as the executive director for Long Island Housing Services, Inc. And lastly, we have Mike Chen. Mike Chen is a civil rights enforcement manager for housing at the Seattle Office for Civil Rights. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here at Both Sides of the Bars. Thank you for having us. How's everybody feeling today? Good. Doing well. Good. So we want to get right to it. And, you know, I'll start, obviously, with Tabor. Um, you know, what is your role at Fortune, very briefly? And, you know, also turn to Mike um, in terms of, like, the Seattle Office of Civil Rights. And how does that work that you do relate to combating housing discrimination against people with criminal justice involvement? Uh, yeah, so uh, very grateful to be here and um, and to talk about this very important issue of housing discrimination against people with criminal justice involvement. Um, my role as housing advocate and special assistant is primarily to, well, initially to build out this initiative here at Fortune, um, which I did by helping to build out infrastructure here to build awareness, make people comfortable coming to us for help um, and developing awareness um, from outside of the organization um, across the country with other like-minded organizations, government agencies, and the like. The main focus of my job is on advocating on behalf of people that have faced discrimination in this, in this manner. And uh, the first thing I generally try to do is to help people realize that they are valued members of the community and that they deserve to have a safe, affordable place to live. And then I try to convince people that have denied them housing of the same thing, that they are valued members of society, they deserve a second chance, and that's really what the center of, of what we do here at Fortune. We really believe in lifting people up and giving people a second chance. And then the final thing that we work on is pushing public policy, uh, laws that can help better protect against this kind of discrimination, um, educating the community, 
and the real estate industry at large and developing the exchange of ideas with organizations like the Seattle Office of Civil Rights and the Long Island um, Housing Services Organization, which we're going to hear from today. So thank you very much for letting me uh, share that. Absolutely. I want to turn to you, Mike. You know, Mike, you are in Seattle and Seattle has been lifted up as an example by many housing advocates and folk uh, because of the unique work that you all are doing. And you're like you're leading work as um, uh, a person who's an, obviously um, a civil rights enforcement manager. Talk to us about the work you're doing in Seattle. How is that relevant to housing discrimination? Absolutely. So the Seattle Office for Civil Rights is a city department in Seattle, Washington, established in 1969 to address discrimination in housing, employment, public places, and in contracting. And our mission is to end structural racism and discrimination through accountable community relationships and anti-racist organizing, policy development, and civil rights enforcement. So my role at the Seattle Office for Civil Rights is to implement and enforce new and existing civil rights protections throughout Seattle and to ensure that people who are most impacted by discrimination and racism are protected in housing. And we do this through lots of different proactive and responsive strategies, which includes both outreach and education to communities, providing trainings and technical assistance to businesses, and conducting fair housing testing to ensure compliance. We also address discrimination by conducting investigations, and resolve complaints through our restorative justice mediation program and our investigative findings. Do you want to know a little bit about our fair chance housing law? Yeah, sure. We'd love to hear about that because that's critically important to this discussion. Again, as mentioned, your, the model in Seattle is one that those of us who are in New York City look at as an example. So talk to us a little bit about that, Mike. Sure. I mean, Ian, I'm sorry. I mean, Mike, I'm sorry. Mike? Yes. <laughs> no worries. So I can give you some background on it. In August of 2017, the city of Seattle uh, Council passed the Fair Chance Housing legislation to help prevent unfair bias in housing against renters with past criminal records. And this ordinance prevents landlords from inquiring or asking questions related to an applicant's criminal history and unfairly denying applicants housing based on criminal records. It also prohibits the use of advertising language that automatically or categorically excludes people with arrest records, conviction records, or criminal history. This legislation is a capped, a long, decade-long efforts by grassroots community organizing to address bias against people who have served their time, are seeking to provide for themselves and their families, and have faced barriers to accessing safe and stable housing. And most recently on July 6th of this year, the U.S. District Court rejected a challenge to the city fair chance housing law, which bars most landlords from denying housing to applicants or taking other actions against tenants because of their criminal history. In 2018, the Rental Housing Association of Washington and two individual landlords claimed the ordinance, the fair chance housing law, violated Washington and U.S. free speech and substantive due process protections. What the judge decided, however, was that the ordinance did not violate the plaintiff's substantive due process rights, and the court had determined whether the courts could advance any legitimate government purpose. And in this action, in this, the court held that they actually had reasons for enacting the statute are legitimate and included. The ordinance directly advances the city's interest in combating racial discrimination in housing, and the ordinance directly advances the city's interest in reducing barriers to housing for individuals with criminal records. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And, you know, thank you for sharing that too, um, Ian. And so, I mean, Mike, so we want to turn to Ian now, right? You know, Ian, the work that you do as the executive director for Long Island, Long Island uh, Housing Services is really, really important. And you know, you've talked about source of income and race-based discrimination in the past. Like, how are these types of discrimination, like which oftentimes overlap within criminal justice-based discrimination, impacting people searching for affordable housing in the Long Island community? Sure. Uh, by way of segue, uh, coincidentally, we're also founded in 1969. Uh, we're a civil rights uh, organization that focuses on fair housing. 
Um, I'm very proud that we have been part of the coalitions that got source of income laws passed in Suffolk and Nassau and then in New York State. And the same fair housing organizations are trying to get um, a similar protection for people who are just as involved passed statewide. Source of income was an important thing to pass because one source of income was often used as an excuse for other types of discrimination um, because of racial injustice and economic injustice. And it has provided uh, protection for uh, a large group of people, not only people think initially people who might be on housing choice vouchers, but the uh, people who might have uh, supplements because of their veterans or because of disabilities. Mm -hmm. And those have always become problems, which shouldn't be because income is income is income. If you can pay your rent, you should be able to rent. Uh, in terms of uh, racism, that has been a constant, continuing, and unfortunately unabated problem uh, nationwide. Though Long Island got some recent focus because of Newsday's uh, investigation of real estate agents, but uh, we still see a good number of racially discriminatory uh, complaints come in that we have to bring forward. Uh, the source of income, as we say, helps us, uh, gives us another tool to make sure that there isn't discrimination uh, based on race. Um, we are constantly doing education. We are doing advocacy. We are doing outreach. And we are doing testing and investigation, both for complaints that are brought in by individuals and by going out into the market and making sure that um, there is not discrimination in the market. I am proud to say that we just worked on a report in Suffolk County that came out uh, for uh, the Fair Housing Task Force, and among other things, it is, is looking to pass a county law to protect people who are just as involved for discrimination in housing. So I am hoping that is something we can get to over the next year. Absolutely. You know, and thank you so much for that, you know, Ian. And Mike, I want to turn to you. You know, you spoke about the Fair Chance housing ordinances inside of uh, in Seattle, but you know, what are the best elements of a law like the Seattle ordinance, um, which seeks to eradicate this type of discrimination? Well, attributes of this law that really um, is a crutch and really has made this law really impactful and protective for individuals in our community that have criminal records. I think one of the first elements is it prohibits housing providers from making any inquiries about an applicant's criminal history. Because we know that bias plays out, especially among everyone and housing providers, and they can automatically screen out individuals because of the bias that they've learned from those screening records. The law also prohibits screening companies from pulling criminal histories, records on housing applicants, for people who are looking for housing in Seattle. So it's not just housing providers, but it's also um, screening companies who are, who are working for housing providers in screening out application, applicants. Unlike other laws that provide protection for people with criminal history, there is no look back period or list of criminal offenses provisions that housing providers can automatically or categorically exclude applicants from housing. This is a really an important aspect of this law because what we are removing is the discretion that housing providers can automatically take out individuals who have criminal history and there is no look back period at all, nor can they look at a list of criminal offenses that will automatically and categorically exclude people from housing. One of the things that we've learned in our studies is that housing is critical to ensure that people have opportunities to be members in our community. And if they cannot find housing, it is unlikely they can find jobs, meaningful jobs, and be a contributor to our community. Another element is that we have codified what HUD, HUD's guidance on the use of criminal records by housing providers, which was published back in April 6, 2016, 
which prohibits housing providers from you the from the use of advertising languages that automatically or categorically excludes people with arrest records, conviction records, or criminal history from applying for housing. So an example of this would be if an advertising in Seattle said, we do not rent to people with criminal histories, that would be an automatic violation of our law. And the fourth element that we think is really, really important is that housing providers may inquire whether the applicant is, a, is on the sex offender registry, but can only consider adult convictions and must use an individualized assessment before denying an applicant based on these convictions. So it does allow some sort of discretion for housing providers to look into an individual on a sex offender registry, but they still have to take do an individualized assessment for each applicant, and it can only base, be based on the adult convictions in that record. The other aspect to really remember is that laws are really as as as, um, as strong, or as only as effective if they have appropriate funding enforcement infrastructure in place. At the Seattle Office for Civil Rights, we have 13 enforcement staff who are dedicated to ensure that the city's anti-discrimination laws, which includes the Seattle Fair Chance Housing Ordinance, um, is enforced throughout the city. And we do this as a group to ensure not just proactively and responsively, but looking at discrimination at all different fronts. And this is a really a critical aspect of what makes this law as effective in Seattle, along with all the other cities' non-discrimination laws. And that's really interesting, that model, um, right, Mike? It's 13 of you, right? 13 civil rights enforcement managers who's a part of their role is essentially to make sure that people are not discriminated against in the housing based on their criminal legal and histories, et cetera. So I think that's a really powerful and unique model. What I wanna do now is kind of turn to some questions for each of you um, around some of what we've been discussing. Um, and maybe I'll start with Taber uh, to talk about what are the key enforcement strategies um, that must be a part of any effective implementation of a fair chance or other similar laws once they're on the books. And I'll start with you, Tavar. Yeah, thank you very much, Andre. And I, I must say that a lot of what I'm about to say, I learned from uh, folks like Ian and, and Mike and, and many others who I've spoken with across the country um, from their experience with existing laws. Obviously, that's what I've drawn upon in, um, in sort of setting this up. And, and we believe in a four-pronged approach. Um, to addressing enforcement because it's one thing to have the law in the books, but it's another thing altogether to actually have proper and legitimate implementation and enforcement. So the first two items relate to education and training and outreach. The first one would be to the public at large. People don't understand the rights, especially when a law has just changed. Um, they don't understand the application process, what things to look for in advertisements, what subtle, there's different subtle ways that people and companies can now uh, do discrimination. And many times people are not up on the latest subtle ways of discrimination. So reaching out to people, letting them know about their rights and letting them know about the change in the law and how that protects them. Um, the second is education and outreach and training of real estate companies, screening companies and the like, getting them comfortable with and understanding that for example, there is no real correlation, all things considered, all things um, controlled for between someone spending time in prison or jail and being a worse tenant or a more dangerous tenant. Um, I don't think my building is more dangerous because I live there, for example. Um, so reaching out to the real estate um, industry and, and the screening company industry as well and helping to make it clear to them that they should not be doing certain things anymore and that it's not in their interest to do so. Um, the third is, partnering with government agencies, divisions, and like-minded organizations um, from across the country. We believe that this is a really important part of the modern civil rights movement. We don't think this is just something in isolation. We believe that when you make the changes to the laws, you can lead by example. And part of that really is going to mean that we have to have these meaningful partnerships with government agencies that are tasked with enforcement, try to get them as many resources as possible while also doing our own own um, advocacy work, which is the final prong, um, advocacy, testing, and if and where necessary, litigation. 
Now, we don't do testing ourselves here at Fortune. We actually work with a partner, the Fair Housing Justice Center. Um, we do really focus on advocacy, and that's what I focus on most of my time on, which is really helping people when they're in the face of this, really what can be a traumatic experience being discriminated on solely because of something that in some cases happened 10, 20, 30 years ago, and maybe the worst thing you've ever done, but does not define you. Um, and so I believe that those four areas are really critical for enforcement strategies. Sure, and, and Ian, any thoughts, following thoughts with that? Um, in terms of strategies, et cetera. And then we'll we'll go to you, Mike. Yeah, I, I do want to rise up something that both Mike and Taber said, because of the discussion I recently had in Suffolk, is that exactly what Mike said, laws without funding for enforcement are just empty shells. And the not only enforcement, but as Taber said, education. We've had a local county source of income law here for like 10 years, but we are still running across housing providers who are violating that law. Now, there's no way they can't know by now that the law exists, that's their business. So uh, education and making an awareness and pushing on people that they have to follow the law requires um, constant work and requires funding, whether it's the government doing it or private nonprofits. Uh, that work is just as important as passing the laws. And I would say passing the laws and housing for justice involved is a key part of what the Black Lives Matter movement has brought criminal justice reform to the fore without providing tools for the people who have already been justice involved in, in order to be uh, take advantage of being a citizen, uh, it becomes meaningless. Yeah, thank you so much for that too, Ian. Mike? Yeah, I completely agree with both Ian and Tabor on this in terms of the four-prong approach, as well as just how we address these particular issues that really plague our society. And I think it starts with how do we address racial bias in our community? And how do we address racial bias as it, as it relates to criminal history? I think I work with a lot of uh, landlords in Seattle, and that is still a big, big barrier for people finding housing, is bias towards uh, individuals with criminal history. And if you look at the disproportionate number of people who have a criminal history and criminal records, and looking at both black and brown populations in our country, and in particular in Seattle and other communities, it, it makes it even more difficult to find stable housing. I think another thing to also focus is how do we center and engage communities historically impacted by racism, oppression, and colonization who have been harmed by policies and practices that have a racial disproportionate impact on communities of color. I think we have, we as a, as a government have an obligation to address this face on and to talk about racism and talk about policies and practices that are so cons that are supposedly race neutral, but have a racial impact in our community. And I also think one thing that civil rights agencies across the country needs to have a conversation is how do we begin the converse, how do we begin the shift from addressing not just individual forms of discrimination to systemic and institutional forms of racism? I think we have to be uh, we have to work together with our community partners. We have to work with other government agencies and nonprofit organizations to really face off and, and address discrimination, especially as it pertains to criminal records. Because one of the challenges that we see and we hear from find jobs and housing when they have a criminal history and what we as a society need to start to do is begin to address these concerns and remove these barriers so that everyone has an opportunity to be a member in our community and to find housing. Mike, Ian, Taver, unfortunately our time is up, but really wanna thank you for talking to us and sharing with our viewers the impact of housing discrimination and what are the strategies that can be used to address those things. Um, as always, we thank you um, we thank our viewers for joining us today. And 
you know, we thank you all again just for a really thought-provoking conversation. And we will certainly have each of you back at some point to give us an update on where we are with addressing housing discrimination and the strategies that are being used and its effectiveness. In the meantime, on behalf of the Fortune Society, we thank you so much for tuning into both sides of the bars. If you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, check us out on the web at www.fortunesociety.org. Um, that's www.fortunesociety.org. My name is Andre Ward, and I really appreciate you joining us as we critically look at both sides of the bars. Thank you.